Hello fellow lovers of the liminal and the weird and welcome to another video by Liminal Spaces. Today I'm going to be doing a deep reading of Stanislaw Lem's The Futurological Congress. I actually read this because a lot of people recommended uh, Lem in the comments on a lot of my other videos, so I figured it was time to give him a try and I was not let down. This was uh, an incredible read, a crazy read, uh, and one that we're going to have to really dig into to come up with some kind of interpre interpretation or understanding of. I did do a video earlier in the week on this same book. If you haven't seen that one, go ahead and go back and watch that one because it sets up a little bit of the ground situation uh, and that way we don't have to cover it so thoroughly here in this video. I will cover everything I did in that video, but I'm going to go over it really quickly. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to say is, of course, I do not have a first edition of this book to show off, which is what I usually like to do. Uh, however, I did order a, uh, a first edition in English of this book from 1974. It should be coming, and I should have it in about a week or two. Uh, Usually, of course, I'd like to have these link up so that I have the first edition to show you when I'm talking about it. That didn't work out this time, uh, so I will show you the first edition of this book when it comes in a channel update at a later date. Okay, let's get into it. This is a book about a man named Tichy. His first name is I-J-O-N, which I don't know how to pronounce in Polish. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing Tichy correctly, but Tichy is easier for me to say, so I'm going to say Tichy for this character for the uh, rest of this deep read. Just really quick, going to break down the ground situation. Tichy is sent to the 8th Annual Futurological Congress. Um, it's at the Hilton in Costa Rica, which has 164 floors. It is a very imposing hotel in the future Earth that we're in. And the subject they're going to be discussing at this particular Congress is overpopulation and what they can do about that. We don't really get to know what a futurologist is at this point in the book. Uh, they never really explain it, but from what I understand, it's some kind of a think tank that tries to solve problems that they can see are going to be huge in the future. So the name kind of speaks for itself, I guess. This novel starts right away with absurdism. Um, I had to read the first couple of pages like three or four times because the absurdism is so intense that you can lose focus because there's so many words that he made up or so many terms that he smushed together to make a new word for this future society that it's, it is a lot to take. Uh, and I just want to tell you right off the bat, stick with it. But it's absurd from the start and we get this very satirical, uh, dark, humorous view of society. Uh, and it's a violent society. Societies become very violent. Everybody has weapons. And when he checks into his room, there's a little plaque or I think it's hanging on his door or something that says, uh, your room is guaranteed bomb free. Like that's just an, an amenity that this hotel includes is that you're not going to get blown up in your room, uh, which makes us instantly think about, well, how often is that a case, uh, the case in this new society? Uh, people get shot for seemingly no reason. At one point, somebody goes to pull out a business card and is shot by bodyguards of another person. And everybody that witnesses the scene has a kind of a oops response. And they throw a, a tarp over the body and that's that. So it's a very strange world where aggression and violence has bubbled up to the surface. And it's... It seems like a way that many people deal with things. And Titchy seems right at home in this. He's not violent, but he is. he has a callousness that only desensitization can give. Uh, he can walk away from these kind of things with, without an emotional response, probably because he's seen him all of his life, so it's not such a big deal for him. His room... And I... I think I understand this correctly. I don't think this was his room. I think this was his... I don't think this was the hotel. I think this was his suite itself had a whole area of palm trees. 
and an all-female orchestra that is playing classical music while simultaneously doing a strip tease. And I think this is just in his room. So there's this juxtaposition of senseless violence next to opulence and extremely well-off living. Before the... Uh, first con- before the first meeting of the day he meets a guy who has a gun that he calls the pope assassinator or something like that i can't remember but it's specifically a gun made to kill popes and this guy wants to go kill the pope that's like his big thing uh and he's apparently done this before he's killed popes before uh and he doesn't do it because he hates the pope or anything like that he actually is very much a Catholic and loves the Pope, but he just feels like it's his calling to go out and kill the Pope. This is the kind of absurdity that we are given at the beginning of this novel, and I found myself drowning a little bit in it because I couldn't come up with an interpretation for it. It's And, and, and I think the problem is, is it's just world building. It's not trying to make a philosophical point. And of course, we can extrapolate extrapolate philosophical points from this right he's obviously making statements about violence and overpopulation and opulence and all this kind of stuff but he doesn't push us in that direction and usually when a writer wants you to think about things they'll kind of push you but this is just straight up world building right he's not he's not asking you to make a value judgment he's just straight up saying this is what the world is and that was a little bit hard for me to get into also because it was hitting so hard and so fast that i didn't feel like i ever had a second to take my take a breath and figure out what was really going on here i just had to go along for the ride and that is I think I've already said this once, but I'm going to say it again. You have to go along for the ride with this book. And it it pays off big if you do. So they do a really interesting thing with the first conference that's held. And that is that there are so many people presenting that it's absolutely impossible for all of them to state their case. So what they've done is, is created pamphlets where all the paragraphs are numbered and you can review all these pamphlets before the Congress to save time. And he's constantly not having time to review his papers. But basically, when you go into the room in order to save time, people don't s- express their ideas. Instead, they just say, paragraph 24. And somebody else will say, wait, wait, what about paragraph 26 and 27? And they'll say, well, yes. 24 but you also have to take into consideration paragraph 25 and somebody will scream no it has to be paragraph 24 and this is what debates look like and having gone to a lot of uh, academic conferences and sat through many lectures this this really kind of the the satire of this really hit me I, i i really enjoyed this part this was part of this rapid fire um satirical witty humor that really worked on me uh because i can see people doing exactly this and doing it in all seriousness and really arguing for paragraph 24 which if you haven't read paragraph 24 would make no sense so later that night titchy goes into his room and he ends up drinking some tap water and soon after he suddenly starts feeling feelings of love and contentment and benevolence for his fellow mankind and he he realizes pretty quickly that he's been drugged so he starts testing it and thinking about his enemies and realizes that he has empathy for his enemies and this terrifies him Uh, he's disgusted with himself uh, and he is terrified of this drug that is making him hallucinate in this manner The drug that he is drugged with in the tap water is called Benign Misers. I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly. This book is just littered with pharmaceutical terms that that Lem made up. Uh, And they're not just straight up gibberish. he, He really considered what pharmaceuticals he smushed together to make new words. It's really, really smart. But of course, Benign Misers are... A drug that make you feel more benign. 
as he's going through this problem, a riot has broken out. Uh, and it's not really, we're not really sure if it's a riot or a revolution. It seems like both. Uh, but the hotel basically comes under attack uh, by rioters. And Titchy is stuck way up on this high floor where his suite is. And he's trying to get rid of the effects of this drug. And he does so by starting to hurt himself. He starts violently knocking his shin into things so that it will cut and bleed. Uh, and eventually he causes himself enough pain to get over this benign loving feeling, this empathy that he has in order to go out and see what's going on. Uh, so he goes out to see what's going on. And in the process, he, he goes down many floors, gets to the bottom floor of the hotel, just as the government starts bombing the area with these benign miser drugs. So the rioters, he can see whenever these grenades or bombs hit with all this hallucinogenic drugs in them, they start suddenly holding hands and forming circles and, and they're not fighting anymore. So he runs into a professor, Professor Trottle Reiner. I don't know if I'm saying that name right. I'm going to just call him Professor throughout the rest of this because there's only one professor. So it's Professor Trot Trottle Reiner. Um, so the, he meets uh, this professor that he's known. And the professor says, ooh, they probably keep oxygen tanks over here. Let's go over there. And they run and they get oxygen tanks trying to not be affected by all the bombing of the benign misers that are going on. And they escape into the sewer underneath the Hilton. And when they get down there, a ton of the staff of the Hilton have also escaped. So there's just a bunch of people laying around on this platform with icky sewer water running kind of like a river next to the platform. And things start to get weird. Uh, their masks don't work that great. They take them off at one point to see if the air is fine. Uh, and then suddenly... Titchy sees these rats walking by on their hind legs and really trying to act as human as possible. And he realizes that, that he is breathing in these hallucinogens and that they are affecting him. And he's starting to freak out. And right as that happens, the a, a soldier peeks down into the sewer through the manhole cover that was in the Hilton. They didn't have to go outside. They went through down through the Hilton. A soldier pops out and says, hey, we've got to get you out of here. And they evacuate everybody from out of there. And they run Titchy over and put a jet pack on him. And they're like, all right, fly out of here. And he flies out and he can't figure out how to make the jet pack work. And eventually he runs out of gas and comes plummeting towards the ground and wakes up falling into the sewer water in the sewer. He's rolled off his, this piece of concrete into the sewer and it scares the crap out of him because he realizes he was hallucinating that entire time and he can't really trust what's going on. So he climbs back up onto the platform and sits next to the professor and soldiers come out, come down the manhole again and like, we got to get you out of here. And they take them all out and they put him on a helicopter and the helicopter crashes, and he wakes up in a hospital. And he, he, he's kind of groggy, and he's confused, and he gets up, and he looks in the mirror, and he is, it's, it's him, it's Titchy in, in his own mind, but he's in the body of a young, beautiful black woman. And this freaks him out, of course, because he's not himself anymore, uh, and the doctors run and they're like, did you show him what he looked like? And they're like, yes, uh, yes, we didn't mean to. There was a mirror that somebody was supposed to remove, but they didn't remove the mirror. And they're like, oh my God, he's going into shock. We're going to have to do surgery on him again. And he's like, do surgery on me again? Why? And they put him on a gurney and put him under and he wakes up. And this time he's in the body of a kind of larger gentleman with red beard and red hair. And he walks out of the room. There's no doctors around. And the riot seems to still be going on. And he walks out of the room. And he meets himself. His own body. And it turns out the professor is in his body. 
And Titchy's pissed. He's like, why are you in my body? Um, and why am I in this body? And it turns out that the body that Titchy is in is the leader of the rebellion of the rioters. So everybody wants to kill him. So he freaks out and starts running. I can't remember what exactly happens after that, but he instantly wakes up falling into the sewer water again. So this is kind of our second round and he pulls himself back up and sees the professor and they talk for a bit and he's trying to figure out what's going on and how uh, he can get things back to normal again. Soon after this, soldiers peek down through the manhole again, try to rescue him and this time he's like, no, no, this is stupid. I'm not going. Uh, I know this is a hallucination. This is ridiculous. I'm not going. And they're all like, all right, suit yourself. And they take everybody else, including the professor, and he is left alone in the sewer. And he's just sitting there, and the rats are being weird. And then suddenly, all these people come up in scuba gear out of the sewer water and come up on the platform. And it turns out that they are the revolutionaries. And... He's like, oh, wow, you guys are a hallucination. This is ridiculous. And they're like, this guy's crazy. And he's like, yeah, you can say whatever you want. You're not real. And uh, they're like, well, how about if we kill you? And he's like, yeah, that's a good idea because a hallucination can't kill me. So go nuts. Um, and they argue about this. And finally, somebody shoots him in the chest. And then just as he's starting to black out, they shoot him in the face. And he wakes up in a hospital. And this doesn't get too clear um, because he was shot in the face but apparently his body is fine and he wakes up in a hospital and the doctors around are talking about the fact that no he wakes up in a mental hospital and the doctors are talking about the fact that he no longer can trust reality that 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 his brain was so broken by all of the hallucinations that he breathed in that he he doesn't trust uh reality at all and he makes fun of him a little bit he calls uh, uh somebody hallucinathan and another girl hallucinlinda right because he just he's sure that this is all hallucination uh and they say okay there's really no cure for this so what we're gonna do is freeze him and in the future, when they've figured out how to deal with this kind of stuff, they'll unthaw, them, uh, unthaw him, and they can deal with that. So they freeze him. All right, I want to stop here because this is, in my opinion, really the first part of the book. Um, and there are no chapters. There are very rarely even breaks in this text. The, the paragraphs are long. So, I mean, any page of this you can open up and there are, he does make paragraphs when people are talking, but there are just really long paragraphs throughout, especially at the beginning. This is a better, I don't know if you can see that, but yeah, that's, that's one big old paragraph and it actually gets more normal in paragraphs uh, toward the end, but we'll get into that in just a, a bit. So this is the third iteration of saying this. I'm sorry. Stick with this. Even if you think of all the things I've just said, it just seems like a chaotic scattershot of a mess. Uh, and you have to appreciate this for the wor world building, how quickly people go to surgery, um, how quick people are to use drugs to stop people from doing things, uh, the use of violence continuously and almost without consequence. Like all this stuff is, is about to be left behind. And that's another thing that might have felt weird about this first part is th this is one novel, but it feels like two stuck together. Like the tone change that occurs from this point on in the novel is massive. Uh, and honestly, when I was about 65 pages in, uh, I called my brother and said, yeah, unfortunately, I don't think I care for this book much because it's got a lot of humor. It's got a lot of wit, but the absurdism and chaos is so off the charts that I can't pin any of it down to really come up with an interpretation 
that I feel I can give textual evidence to. I'm sure many of you, many different readers can read this and say, no, the first part's the best part. I'm sure that can absolutely happen because art is in the eye of the beholder, right? Um, but for me, this first part was really difficult to get through uh, because it was scattershot insanity with no real plot which is not what I look for when I look for weird and psychedelic in my sci-fi writing. I, I try to look for weird and puzzle-like and full of depth, more depth than wit, more philosophy than wit and humor, we'll say. So this first part was hard for me, um, which is why I keep saying, keep reading, keep reading, keep reading, because on page 65... He wakes up uh, way in the future. He awakens in 2039. And from here on out, the book is a journal kept by Titchy of how he is learning about and coming to understand the new world that he's in. And all the absurdism in the prose... No, that's not, that's not true. The, the, the absurdism begins to take a back seat to what feels like specifically plot. And suddenly there's a through line that we can grab onto. Um, and it was for me kind of a breath of relief that I could finally see what he had to say overall through the plot of the novel instead of just what he had to say in this strange world building that he did before. The world he wakes up in is a utopian society, hands down, a utopian society. Uh, money is no longer an issue. People can just walk into the bank and say, I would like to take a loan for this much money. But the bank never tries to collect the loans because the society is completely dependent on chemicals and drugs in order to affect its mood and... One of the drugs that they can get makes them feel like they have a moral obligation to pay back the bank. So some people do, some people don't. There are art galleries that have Rembrandts and Da Vinci's for sale for cheap. The originals that you can hang on your wall. Uh, everybody in this society can apply to get a Nobel Prize. It is individuals experiencing the perfection of mood and life through chemicals and drugs. I think of the idea of Soma, and this is Soma taken to a, a new level. This is also similar to the mood organ in Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, where they wake up and decide what all their moods are going to be throughout the day using chemicals. Yeah, this, this society is constantly, like every couple of minutes, popping pills to fine-tune and change their emotions to be the proper emotion for the time. And, of course, all of them are seem very happy because of all these pills they're taking. And there is a opulence, a richness to everything around them. Like, society is really flourishing in 2039. It took him a while to actually step foot out of the hospital where they woke him up because they had to really slowly acc acclimate him to the society. They didn't just want to throw him out into the street and say, good luck, enjoy yourself. Um, and he had a private nurse named Eileen who helped acclimate him to this new world and they eventually start a relationship. Of course, a lot of this he has a hard time taking in. He's not 100% into this new society. We saw him buck against the benign misers earlier in the novel. He doesn't like this idea of not being in control of and feeling his own emotions. So he really pushes back, but he slowly is more and more won over. Uh, and he has to learn all these new strange things. For instance, the TV is so real that at one point two actors merge together accidentally and end up in his apartment and trash his apartment and then disappear 
into a shower of sparks because unfortunately the weird technology that they use to make this television so real shorted out a little bit and this is one of the things that can happen and she says Eileen says, well, you're lucky you didn't get attacked. So TV can be kind of scary in this new world. Um, he notices that everybody constantly has labored breathing in this world and is co really confused about that because people are living luxuriously, but they constantly have this kind of ragged breath, which you really can't understand. And every once in a while, he feels a coldness that he can't really understand either. Uh, but slowly he comes to accept all of these strange things. In a weird way, this future world kind of reminded me of a mix of uh, Idiocracy and Futurama. And I know that that's a strange mix, but that's kind of what it seemed like. The people seemed almost childish in their emotions because they relied so much on these pills that they couldn't make any decisions for themselves. And the insanity of the future tech, that's what really reminded me of Futurama. Um, yeah, it, it, it seemed like a more serious take on Futurama and Idiocracy. And of course, these are both um, frozen sleepers waking up in the future. So I can see why I thought of them. So Eileen goes to her aunt's for a while just to visit. And he hangs out with a friend. I think he was his lawyer or something at first. I can't remember. But anyway, he hangs out with a, a friend, a guy named Symington. And Symington is the head of a company named Procrustix. And Symington asks him to pose for him. The book doesn't really tell us what creative endeavor he is posing for. So Symington is, is sitting there doing something. And at one point he takes a pill and it makes him seemingly enraged. And he stares kind of bloody murder at Titchy, which really confuses him. But then he's fine. Afterwards, they have a conversation, and this is what I'm going to call part three of the book. Uh, this happens uh, in the late 90s pages. The pages are in the late 90s. I think it's 90, 95 or 96 when this occurs. And every bit of this book is worth these last 50 pages. These last 50 pages are some of the best science fiction I have ever read this is the reason you have to read this book. You need to make it to this point because I guarantee you, you will read these last 50 pages in one sitting. They'll blow your mind. Uh, it is absolutely incredible. And this shows me that Lem is a writer that I'm definitely going to be coming back to because he can, he can really tell a, a sci-fi story. It's, it's incredible. It really is incredible. Uh, and a philosophy comes into it at this point. So at first we had this real dark humor, world building satire at the beginning. And then we have this, the only way I could explain it is a mix of a little bit of that satire because he's, he's doing the world building for 2039. Um, so we see this weird world that we're living in and there's world building, but instead of just a constant barrage of satire, it becomes more structurally sound in the sense that we're learning about Titchy. I feel like I'm starting to know his character very well. And we have plot points like they're in a relationship and he has to stay a couple of days in the hospital and then he can come out. Like these plot points suddenly seem to slow down to a level that makes sense. And then we get this third part, which in my opinion is very similar to Philip K. Dick. And I'll get into... a. Uh, connection between these two writers later not a connection a comparison a philosophy philosophy starts to come into the novel and instead of a satire on society he is directly philosophizing about what this type of utopia 
would create the truths behind this kind of utopia. And this was so interesting and so good. So he's talking to Symington and Symington asks him, hey, do you know what Procrustix actually makes my company? And Titchy says, no, I don't. And he says, we make evil. And Titchy is really confused at this point. And they go into a dialogue that is, is just incredible where Symington explains that all the mood altering has jumped over the darkest, most animalistic parts of humanity. And because the drugs don't allow that to come up, it festers in there. And he says, this is the real problem with uh, the concept of a utopia is that humans by nature want to commit evil. That we can't stay away from it. That there is this side to us that wants to commit evil. And of course, evil is a term that has to be defined because it can mean different things to different people. For example, if your neighbor embarrasses you by pointing out something that you did that you shouldn't have done, suddenly you'll have a violent urge. Instead of responding to him and defending yourself, you have this violent urge to just cause violence to him. And then he talks about the viewing, the way men view women uh, and that they have a tendency to have thoughts towards especially pious women. And he, and he uses um, Joan of Arc as an example of, of virtue and virginity and all this. And then says, um, and of course, people will have evil thoughts about Joan of Arc. And Titchy is absolutely disgusted. So it, it turns out that Symington is making pills that give people the experience of doing awful violence to other people without them actually doing it. So there's no consequences. And he says, this is how our society vents. This is how we vent. This is how this utopia is able to exist is because we're able to vent like this. And Titchy is absolutely disgusted. And they go on talking and... Symington starts to describe the fact that his art, which is creating this these evil daydreams for people, uh, his art is hard to accomplish because at first when he just created, you know, here's three different experiences of crime and evil, people didn't like them as much. And what he realized is people want to commit these acts of evil, but they want to feel like they are not evil, like they're justified, like they have to commit them. And he goes even further and says, like it is almost um, an angelic good that they're doing when they're doing that evil. And he says, this is the really hard part about my art, is that I have to create these storylines in order to make people feel like they are heroic good people for doing these terrible evil deeds and Titchy is disgusted and he leaves and he, he suddenly he feels like the whole society is not what he wanted uh, he's disgusted he starts thinking about wanting to go back to his own time which is impossible of course because they can freeze and send him into the future they can't send him back and he suddenly understands when he's at parties and he sees somebody take a, a break and say, excuse me for just a minute and goes and takes a pill and then looks at him for a second. He's noticed this with this society. He suddenly understands that they are memorizing every detail of him so that they can put him into this private hell they're creating for him. Right. Um, people are constantly commi committing terrible violence against each other without consequence because it's not really them and this concept goes into so much philosophy like you could write a dissertation just on this idea from this part of the novel 
you know, is it is thought crime, right? And all this kind of stuff. Uh, things that we think that we would never admit to anybody else. This kind of stuff, right? All of this uh, is also controlled by drugs in this society. Really wild. Titchy can't handle it. Uh, he he s- stops going out. He decides he's only going to eat food he cooks at home so that he can get off all the drugs of this society. Uh, Eileen comes back from her aunt's house and she can't understand what's wrong with him. And finally, she presents him with a choice. Do you want me to be in love with you or not? And she holds out a black pill and a white pill, saying specifically, like, one of these is love, one of these is who cares anymore, right? And he won't choose. And that really pisses her off because he doesn't want drugs to make every decision, right? How strange would it be if you could take a pill to be in love with somebody? It wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter who you love. You could take a pill and be in love with that person. Uh, it's, it's a wild concept. So she leaves. She's had enough. She leaves. He's alone. He's completely devastated. He says he's surrounded by monsters in this new society. Uh, and then he finds an advertisement. I don't know what it was for, but Uh, He sees the professor's name and realizes that the professor is also alive. And of course, his first thought is, oh my God, I'm still in the sewer hallucinating, uh, which is both exhilarating and terrifying to him because so much time has passed. Uh, But he pushes this concept away and finds the professor and goes in and meets with him. So he meets with his old friend, the professor. They both were frozen in the past and rethought. His, the, the professor looks younger. Um, he says, yeah, they de-aged me when they woke me up. They didn't have to do that with you uh, because Titchy, I think, is already a younger man. And they get to talking and Titchy slowly... Well, no, first, the professor says he's become a futurologist again. Um, and Titchy's like, there's they exist in this world? And he says, yes, but they're not the same thing at all. He says, I'm a linguistic futurologist. And I only bring this up because it's such an interesting idea. And it's quite a few pages in this uh, in this middle part. And it's the concept that if you just do word association, and he they do a bunch of it in the book, uh, he'll ask Titchy for a word and then associate on the word until he comes up with another word. And then these futurologist linguistics will try and come up with a meaning for the the nonsense word that they've created and they try to do it by saying okay what are the roots that we got from this word it's really wild and he says if we could go back to the 15th century and they came up with the word robot using this maybe they'd know about robots all the way back then Um, It's ridiculous, but presented so well um, and so nonsensical that it's 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 very interesting. It's again a a another satirical part of the novel that really worked for me, mainly because it seems to poke fun a little bit at uh, certain academic studies. I think the 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 that sometimes our most educated guesses, if we're not careful, can fall into make-believe. That's the, the best way I can say that. Um, I'm not anti-academia. Uh, I'm an academic myself. Uh, but, uh, I mean, of course, part of being something means that you can see the flaws in uh, the system that you are a part of. And I think that Lem was making fun of that system and pointing out some of those flaws. And this is one of the ways that he does that. And I'm not going to lie, it was interesting and hilarious to me. I really enjoyed it. After this, Titchy starts to explain to the professor that he really doesn't care for this society. And the professor offhandedly says, oh, you think you can't handle it. Uh, You'd be knocked out if you knew the truth. And Titchy's like, what? And he's like, okay, look, I'll, 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 I'll help you out. I'll give you uh, uh, a chance to see the truth here. And he pulls out a bottle with a cork in it. And he says, this is called Up and Atom. And what it does is, is it 
destroys hallucinations. It's a drug that stops you from hallucinating. And he says, all you got to do is sniff it, like sniffing salts. And he said, but when you do, do not freak out. Remember where you are. And they're in this really high class, beautiful restaurant. So he pops the cork and takes a sniff of this stuff and his eyes tear up. And when he wipes them, he suddenly sees reality that they're in this weird concrete bunker and they're sitting at a, re a rickety table and there's these kind of shelves on the wall that people are sitting on above them because the room is so full of people that the the hallucinations that he was experiencing were making the people seem like plants and other things to try to hide the fact that he was in this overpopulated hell. Uh, the food they were eating was pheasant, but when he sniffs this up and at him, uh, it turns into this weird goo that sticks to his fork and is disgusting. Uh, and so basically, in this future, the world has become so overpopulated uh, and kind of disgusting that humanity can't take it. I'm, I have a hard time with really, really big cities myself. Being surrounded by so many people in your space is going to be hard no matter what. And so the way they've solved this is they've realized that hallucinogens can make the world bearable. That people can live in this awful, overpopulated hellhole by making sure that they're all drugged. Um, and it keeps them from rebelling, and it keeps them from rioting. Of course, Tichy is completely shocked um, and disgusted even more by this world that he is living in. He ends up going to the professor's apartment. The professor's gone when he gets there, so he lets himself in. Uh, and the professor comes back and then tells him, they're talking about cars, and the professor's like, Sniff some more up and at him and go and look out the window. And he sniffs the up and at him and goes and looks out the window. And all the cars on the highway suddenly turn into people pretending to drive running down the road. Right? There's, there's, there's no real cars in this time. I think he sees one real car and it's just this trashy thing. But most people are running down the road. Uh, and slowly, as the up and atom wears off, it turns into all these beautiful cars again. And the professor's talking about, yeah, it's really crazy because it drops deaths by heart attack because this is such good exercise. But eventually, you know, not everybody's made to run a marathon, so it brings up all these other health problems. And it's at that moment that Titchy realizes why everybody seems like they are constantly breathing so heavily. It's because everywhere they go, they run, thinking that they're driving. Wild. Crazy. Uh, and it turns out that the professor had recently gone to another futuro Futurological Congress meeting. Uh, and this is like the 78th, and they were at the 8th at the beginning. And... People are still trying to decide what to do about overpopulation. And he presents... And now, instead of just reading out paragraphs, the all the concepts that everybody needs to do be, can be done with drugs. So you like lick this candy cane, and it gives you all the information about an idea of what you can do for the future. Really interesting. Uh, but they start presenting all these ideas... Uh, one of them is to take away all the glitz and glam and then give people drugs that make them think that living in this overpopulated hellhole is the best way to live. Uh, so that basically their emotions are like, I love living this way. Another idea was to take everybody's brains out and just keep them in little storage boxes and just use the drugs to make them think they're happy all the time. Uh, they're going through all these ideas. Uh, and earlier... The professor had handed him two vials and said, okay, here's the problem. Uh, the up and atom that you've been sniffing apparently is actually a ruse to make you to, to break the illusion, but also 
to secretly put another illusion. And he gives him two vials. And he says, sniff this one first and this one second. And you'll be able to see the real truth of reality. And so he's listening to the professor talk about these different ideas of how to deal with the future. So while he's listening to the professor talk, he accidentally sniffs one of the vials without meaning to and sneezes a bunch and then opens his eyes and the world is twice as bad as it was before, right? It's not just an overpopulated hellhole. It is a grimy mess. And the professor is almost all machine with just parts of skin stuck to his face and bandages. Um, and he, he, he is, yeah, not even really very much human anymore. And he starts back in disgust and the professor's like, oh my God, did I change? Because he realized he sniffed that and Titchy can't handle it and he jumps and he runs out the, the room and he feels, he hears the professor jump up and try to come after him and fall down and shatter. All of his pieces come apart. Uh, and so he can't get back up. And he runs and there's people everywhere walking around in this building because it's break time and everybody's going in and out and he runs for the elevators and he sees that the elevators don't actually have elevators in them and people think they're getting in elevators but they're actually like climbing up the elevator shaft to go up to different levels of this building um and they're they're they run to the break room thinking they've just done the elevator and they're all panting right because everything they have to do involves this insane amount of work and he looks out the window and there's just people with like bandages and the drugs have made them all messed up and they're growing these weird spines on their back and their skin is all spotty and they have boils everywhere uh just truly disgusting uh the world that that unfolds before him and there's robots standing there with atomizer guns that just constantly shoot drugs into everybody's faces so that they see the, the world that he woke up in. Uh, and this is, he thinks, this kind of final layer, but he brings his hand up and sniffs the third vial. And the next layer of the world peels away. And in this world... There's no windows in any of the... There's no glass in any of the windows. All the buildings are falling in. And it's a deep freeze winter. It is deep freeze winter. And he stares out the window and sees a guy laying down in a snowbank. As if he was laying down in a feather bed. Getting all warm and putting his toes into the, the snow... Um, everybody is emaci emaciated and frozen and the, the landscape is this destroyed frozen world. And when he looks down after having sniffed the, the second vial, um, suddenly all the robots are gone and it's just people spraying the drug that think they're robots I'm sorry, I'm going to have to back up a little bit. I messed up. Right before he accidentally sniffs that vial, the professor tells him the, the history that brought the world to this place. And the history is that they were getting overpopulated and they were having that futurological congress uh, and they decided that the thing to do would be to go to Venus and Mars, terraform it, and make it livable by humans so that they can deal with the, the problem. Unfortunately, the people that are given the job to do that realize really quickly that they can take all the money and just give people the hallucination that they're working. And this eventually comes to disarmament, where... People are paid to make guns and stuff, but they realize it costs a ton of money to make guns and a ton of resources, 
or for a few cents per person, you can just make them hallucinate that they have guns. And uh, you don't need a military anymore because you can just hallucinate people through book, boot camp, right, when you need soldiers. Um, suddenly it becomes cheaper to create the thing in the person's mind than to make the thing. So they stopped making all the things. He says this, this pharmaceutical world goes hand in hand with corruption. And unfortunately, he doesn't explain what happened with all the money and resources. I, I feel like they eventually just started ignoring them uh, because there isn't a huge elite, although there is a little bit of one we'll get to in just a minute. So that's how they started doing this. So when he looks out the window... For the, the second time, after sniffing the second vial, he sees that all the robots that would have been standing in those areas squirting the drugs have all decayed into the earth. And instead, they've just used the hallucinations on people to make the people think that they're robots spraying the population, right? So there's, there's just people uh, all close to death everywhere. And he, Titchy is just completely shocked and decides he's going to find out who the hell is running this, right? Who's the boss here? And he runs, tries to run out the building and there's an old guy dying and he can't get past him. So he turns around and he comes back and he eventually makes it to this office and he's about to run away from the office because he can hear somebody in there. But somebody from it within says, come on in Titchy. And he walks in, and it is Symington. And he is created in this one little office in the middle of this building. He actually has glass in his windows to keep out the cold. Um, and he's wearing kind of nicer clothes. And he has a picture behind him of, of two nude women that are not affected by all the drug use. They're not splotchy, and they don't have spikes and all that kind of stuff. Um, and he and Titchy have a talk and the way that Symington presents this is that there is nothing that can be done. There are too many people and not enough resources. It's actually the year, what year is it? It's actually the year 2098. There are 69 billion people accounted for on the planet and at least 26 billion in hiding. People are walking over each other. Everybody's on top of each other, right? And he says, if this is the way that we're going to go out, if this is the way the human race is going to go out, shouldn't I do everything in my power to make it so that we go out in happiness? And he says, this is a huge humanitarian effort on the world's part. There's a few of us. I think they're called, uh, I can't remember what they're called. It's starting to rain. Hopefully that won't be too loud. Um, when it rains in the desert, it rains fast and hard. We'll see. I better finish this up. There are glaciers coming to this area that they can't stop. They just want people to live a slightly happy life before they die, which is... Of course, the philosophical question of this entire novel, of the entire utopia, right? Um, is, is it better to be plugged into the Matrix or better to be out of it? Um, the way this is presented, I would much rather be in the, in the Matrix because there's no, oh, we got to fight a, uh, machines to live. This is humans on top of humans. There's no answer to the problem of overpopulation there's no well that's not true there's no moral morally correct answer to the problem except for maybe going to other planets um and they can't do that in this society so there's no i mean do they kill a bunch of people what do they do um so what they've chosen to do is make everybody happy while they live and titchy can't really handle this concept so he jumps at him at Symington and they hit the window and he starts choking him and there's a robot because Symington has a robot apparently uh, that suddenly is trying to pull him off and 
He pushes Symington, and they go, both go falling out of the window uh, to their death when they hit the, the ground. And, of course, you probably all saw this coming. He hits the, the sewer water and wakes up in the sewer back in his own time. And the professor is there and helps him out of the sewer. And he's happy to know that uh, tomorrow will be the second day of the Futurological Congress. I didn't need that ending. I didn't need that ending. Uh, I could have had them die hitting the ground and, and, and be happy. Uh, but I don't hate it. It doesn't bother me. It, it's become such a trope, and it was all a dream, right? It's become such a trope that it was kind of hard to take, but but it doesn't really matter because, honestly, this feels like two novels to me. It really does. And, and the whole thing is about hallucination, but I honestly could have read a story that opens with a person being in a hospital with a, a, a problem that could not be fixed, and them freezing him and sending him to this future, and then see this whole future and have it end with him and that guy smashing on the, uh, on the frozen ground at the end. That, to me, is some of the best science fiction I've ever read. Uh, really, truly. I've never read anything this good about uh, overpopulation ever. And I haven't read Harry Harrison's Make Room, Make Room, which is what Soylent Green is based on. But I'm sure you'll see that in the future on this channel. Um, I think Harry Harrison wrote Make Room, Make Room. I think he did. Um, but to me, this is so far the best look at overpopulation that I have read in science fiction. Just mind-blowing. Um, whereas the witty, satirical stuff at the beginning didn't really do it for me. Uh, however, I could see them as two separate stories. I really could. And they might, this might be a fix-up novel. I don't know if these are two stories he slammed together. I have no idea. Um, the tone change is insane. Uh, really, truly insane. Um, but while the first 65 pages is weaker than the rest of the novel, it's not enough to say this novel's ruined or it's only half good. It's nowhere near... The The wit is still funny at the beginning part. Um, it's still a really unique world to get into. If I... So I found a review, and the reviewer said that it, in this novel, that Lem outdicks Philip K. Dick. Uh, and I, I really disagree with that. But I can see where the reviewer is coming from in this idea. Uh, because if I look at the first part of this novel, it reminds me of the first part of Ubik. Uh, and in the first part of Ubik, you have world building and a society that is dark, but it was also satirical and hilarious. Um, of course... I'm going to spoil Ubik just a tiny bit, just a very beginning part. Um, he's trying to leave his apartment, but he has to put a nickel into his door every time he uses it, and he's out of nickels. So he's literally having an argument with his door trying to leave his apartment. Uh, and I was giggling as I read it. It was so funny and so poignant about how far capitalism could go, right, into the into the future. And I feel like... In that one, Dick did a little bit better of a job uh, satirizing futures than Lem did in this one. Um, so there's there's that. If we look at the second part, um, I feel like this novel is slightly similar to uh, The Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch. Uh, they're both about hallucinations and wondering if you're done hallucinating or if you're still hallucinating um and in my opinion this novel like i said earlier really cranks it up a notch from the dick novel there is more layers to this reality onion in this one which is probably why the reviewer said that uh than there are in the dick novel but i feel the dick novel is does just a good a job of making us feel like 
this person's living endless lifetimes throughout his hallucinations and tearing away layers of reality while he does it. So I'd say they are equal uh, on that note. Uh, am I ready to put Lem above Philip K. Dick in my top 10? No, uh, but I'm ready to put him damn close. Um, this is, this is the funnest read I've had for a long time. Uh, that's not true. I've had a ton of fun reads. This is another absolutely fun read that I, I really enjoyed for this channel. Uh, and I cannot recommend it enough. And the minute that you hit page 98, those last 50 pages are some of the most satisfying reads you'll ever have. Just incredible. Um, I, I highly recommend Lem, and I really look forward to reading more of his work. All right, thank you very much for watching to the end of this video. You know I love doing deep reads. Hopefully this was fun for you as well. If you watched it to the end, I appreciate it. Please click like if you enjoyed it, and if you like this kind of content, please click subscribe, and thank you very much for watching.